Hello, and welcome to the Five Core Life Podcast with Will Moore, founder of More Momentum. If you have not already, please make sure to follow and subscribe to the podcast so you get notified when a new episode airs every week. And of course, on today's episode, host Will Moore sits down with the founder of Kickstarter, Yancey Strickler. Yancey discusses his early days founding Kickstarter and ensuring it wasn't just about money, but instead a community-owned network of people trying to help benefit one another and the world. Yancey talks about how he developed his bentoism beyond near-term orientation, and how if it's not widely adopted, this story isn't going to end well for our planet. All around, a super interesting talk on philosophy and life in general. Yancey is a genius and wealth of knowledge. Are you ready to fire on all cylinders? If so, let's go. Everyone has the same five core areas of their life that ultimately determine how happy they'll be. Unfortunately, most of us have developed failure habits in each, and it's Will Moore's mission to help replace those with success habits to maximize momentum. After exiting his business for a combined nine-figure sum, Will learned it's not just about becoming an entrepreneur of your career, but an entrepreneur of the most important business you'll ever run, your life. And to crush it in your life requires firing on all cylinders in your five cores by continually taking action, building habits, and maintaining balance in each. And here he is. What is up? What is How are up? you, man? I'm doing great. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing real well. So I don't know if you remember last time we met, we were at the summit. Yeah. So they canceled that this year, right? Yeah. I, Some of the, LA. Well, you know. <laughs> why? Do you, do you know why? Do you, do, I have no idea. Why? No idea. Um, yeah. No, I mean, right. I, I guess I never received an official email, but I just assumed. I don't even know. But it, when would it have been? around this time November, anyways, it, yeah November yeah it, it's a really cool huge event that was in LA they did them every year and uh, Yancey was one of the is it Yancey is that how you pronounce it that's right that's okay, right good. uh one of the one of the speakers that was talking about the different things he's done and the successes and then how that's translated into his current project so it's been a year so I'd love to give you the floor thank you for being on the show and tell tell our viewers a little about bit about your background and how you got to where you are and then what you're currently working on sure. and where you're headed. Yeah, what's up? Nice to see you all, where, wherever in the world this finds you um, in this crazy time. Yeah, my, my name is Yancey Strickler. I'm the co-founder and former CEO of Kickstarter. So I, um, I'm one of three people who started that and we, we really put crowdfunding into the world. Before crowdfunding, I was a music journalist for 10 years. I started a record label. I like was, you know, just always passionate about culture and art and um, yeah. And then just had this unexpected journey of Kickstarter and helping, you know, 100,000 100, plus new ideas exist in the world, $5 billion go to independent creative people around the world. And, um, and, you know, and along the way, just like discovering what it is to be you know, a good servant leader, what it is to self-manage when everything, everybody thinks things are great, but internally you don't feel that way and vice versa. And sort of, you know, you get thrown into the deep, the deep end uh, pretty fast with an experience like that. And in the past two years, I, I wrote a book that lays out a, a different philosophy, new philosophy for the world called Bentoism, which is based on the idea of expanding our self-interest to think about our now me needs, our future me needs, the person that we want to become, our now us needs of our, who are the people in our life that we're responsible for, what do they need from us, and then future us, our kids if we have them or everybody else's kids if we don't. And so now I lead groups. There's a community of several hundred Bentoists who meet weekly and yeah, um, and yeah just trying to, you know, try, trying to create a positive path forward from where we are while being unafraid to look at what's so challenging, right? Like that's, I think that's the only way forward. So j just trying to make that happen. Yep, so another great thought leader, somebody that's, um, I love when I get people on that have, ha have had, you know, success in the traditional way, which is I always put in quotes because, you know, most people associate success with 
you know, a startup that, that sold or, or, or made a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then that person, you know, it was in a good position after that. But really what you're doing right now, this is what success is. And, and anybody that's been in a position similar to ours. So, you know, I didn't start Kickstarter, but we had a restaurant delivery service and mm-hmm. it was similar to, you know, Grubhub and, and DoorDash and, and, and Uber Eats, but we started way before them and we were able to fortunately exit last year, mm-hmm. um, for, for a nice tidy sum, 320 million didn't all mm-hmm. go to me, but mm-hmm. pretty proud of that, how we were able to build that up. And then we did raise funding and able to, to exit in the end, um, right before the big boys just started coming in hot and heavy. So, yeah. you know, and then what I'm doing similar to you is basically just saying, look, and I'm sure you had a similar feeling. It's like, well, well now what's the meaning of life here? Right. It's like, now I got this big paycheck and it's like, okay, well, what do I want to do now? You can't just sit yeah. around drinking a pina colada on the beach. I, it doesn't work that way. You know, I didn't, I didn't go for the paycheck. Like our part of how we structured Kickstarter was from the beginning saying we never wanted to sell or go public. And that like Kickstarter as a place for new ideas to have the potential to exist. Like that should just be like a public utility that just like does its job and it's just a service and it's just there for people. And that our feeling was if we, if if someone's trying to financially maximize this platform, it will not be that, it will lose that. It will will become exploitive. And so the most meaningful outcome long-term is for this to just be itself and, and to not change. Like our, we looked at Craigslist as a model and um, and I still look at Craigslist as a phenomenal model and business and um, where you're just content to be what you are and you're not trying to ask any more of anybody than what they need you for. Right. But what's interesting is that, you know, for us as founders, that meant from the beginning, we said, hey, we're never going to try to exit. You know, we, we never, the three of us never had any desire for wealth, really. Like we're creative people that just happen to have this idea. And it's like, well, I guess this means we're starting a company. Yeah. But I... Um, there's a moment, it was like my, I, I stepped down as CEO three years ago, and it was like a week or two afterwards, I went and had lunch with a buddy of mine who's also a CEO, um, who had left a while, his company a while before, and his company had gone public, and I found out that day that he had unloaded, he revealed to me, $40 million worth of shares that day, and we're having lunch. And I'm coming in and I'm like there to meet him to pitch him my next 10 ideas for like the next thing I want to do because I just have more energy than I even know what to do with. And he ends up throwing up during lunch. He ends up throwing up during lunch and saying, and he's just, all he could say was like, I can't just be an investor. Like, I don't know what I'm going to be. But I remember at that moment feeling, I am glad I'm hungry. I'm glad I'm hungry. I'm glad I don't face that existential question of, well, what now, you know, what, <laughs> what, what stage of humanity is this? Right. Uh, so at that, at that moment, I felt very grateful for that choice of just, you know, for us selling out, selling the company was what it felt like, you know, extricating ourselves from the community that we were representing. Um, and, and that's, and, and I don't think that's the case for every company. Like I, there are companies I advise and invest in where I'm like, you should try to sell for as much as possible. That is the right outcome. For, that's what makes sense for a business like this. But for Kickstarter, seeing itself as a public trust, wanting to help creative people put ideas in the world, just like being a place of possibility, um, you know, to us, that's, that's what felt like would produce the most credible long-term outcome. Man. Yeah, so thank you for sharing me with that. I, I guess I, and I I incorrectly assumed that there was some sort of paycheck along the way. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, but well, yeah, I love there that. are, but yes, yeah. right. I mean, we'll put. I'm sure you know, peripherally, the fact that you started that up. I'm sure you're you know you're a hot commodity, and then you know we don't have to get into yeah. how you. I mean, yeah. you got to earn a living somehow, right? So. Um, and now you, you know you've written this book, and you've got this. Is, I want to say it's correct, with bentoism. So you're talking awesome. yeah 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 where did that name come from by the way it came from you know i was really um you know it started for me being being a ceo kickstarter wanting to be like the best version of a company you could do and and always trying to like make the right decision and struggling to do that often struggling to do that and, and being in situations where there's a clear financial outcome but there were some like some potentially gnarly community outcomes, whatever social outcomes that like, hey, this isn't as ideal. 
Um, and then you, there's like path B where the financial outcome is less, the social outcomes are also less. And you find yourself in like a 50-50 call where you're like, what are we supposed to do? And, and in the end, what happens is that the rational language of money wins out because everything else just feels like feeling based. And at the end of the day, you don't wanna, you know, you wanna make a defensible decision. You know, you're trying to do the right thing. And what I came to feel was that we lack a language for those moments. We lack like a common language or we can have like an intelligent conversation that considers the various priorities and, you know, things you have to balance. And that, yeah, just that w without that, we're just gonna be a position where the, the, the finance side is gonna win every argument because it just seems like, well, at the end of the day, isn't it about that? And it is for some decisions, but not for all decisions. And so I was just like, really experienced that as a CEO, just feeling like it should be less hard to make a good call. <laughs> If it were less hard to be a good call, that would be what a great thing for the world. Um, and and I end up going a long process of researching the history of how we've defined self-interest and value. Just like how have we thought about these concepts? How have philosophers thought about this? Like what is the origin of this? And I like read deep for a long time. And in the end, one day I was drawing in my notebook and I drew a hockey stick graph. And I thought this is like how we think of our self-interest today. Just this line going up and to the right. And I'm looking at that picture and I realized, well, this x-axis measuring time, it keeps going from now all the way into the future. So that line keeps going. And this y-axis that's measuring like units sold, power, influence, whatever it is, like that also keeps growing because as our, as our self-interest grows, so does our responsibility. The difference between being a solo entrepreneur and having employees or being single or having a family is huge. So I thought our self-interest also extends from me to us. And suddenly this hockey stick graph turned into this two by two of these four boxes. And I thought, oh, there's this like now me quadrant, this future me quadrant, this now us quadrant, future us quadrant. And I just, decided, I just wanted to write a very basic description. And so I just wrote next to it beyond near term orientation. This is like a simple two by two to help you see beyond the near term. And then I realized that that was an acronym for BENTO, beyond near term orientation acronym for BENTO. And I thought about the BENTO box Japanese lunch that has four compartments and a lid, lets you carry a variety of dishes, not too much of any one thing. And I had just read two weeks before this story about how the bento honors the Japanese dieting philosophy called Hara Hachibu, which says the goal of a meal is to be 80% full. That way you're still hungry for tomorrow. And I thought a bento box, we need a bento box for our decisions, for our priorities, for our values, you know, a way to create space not just indulge and gorge ourselves on what's right in front of us and just feeling like we all fall short. Like no one disagrees with that being important. No one would say I do a great job at that all the time. And that it's just like a muscle memory, an exercise, a framework, a kind of a scaffolding that to me, it's about loving yourself. It's about knowing what you're good and bad at and helping yourself and trying to do so in a way that's consistent. And so, for me, it initially started this place of like deep philosophy. And then it just came out in this like very simple thing of just four boxes. And my, when I first had the idea, I immediately had this strong instinct, like this is something that people find out about in someone's living room. This is something that's like a secret on the edge of a party and works its way in. And, um, and so I reached, I was living in LA at the time and I reached out to a friend who hosted salons in her house from time to time. And I was like, I need to present this idea I've had to strangers and see whether or not I throw up. <laughs> and like, <laughs> just what happens? What happens if I try to pitch this? And I did, I present this idea to 30 strangers and um, it was immediately obvious how, how meaningful it was. And, and I quickly discovered, and now it's like all the way that though this began as this like high-minded value for me, like it's a very practical tool. And I now like, teach i've taught thousands of people how to use this and it's just so simple that it sticks it sticks with people and and i didn't know i didn't know that's how it would go you know i had certain feelings about it um but it's you know it's hard it's we're very good at convincing ourselves of things so you need to have you need I, to have those second and third opinions you got to Right. It's like that book, The Lean Startup. Um, there's yeah. there's another book that's, that's similar. It, it's, it's, a, it's a growing 
um, philosophy that, that is taken off, which is as well it should, which is instead of trying to develop it all in your brain and say, I'm sure this is, this is what I think. So I'm sure this is how everybody else is going to love, you know, and, and, and then going through it all. And then, okay, world, here we go. Like what you did is exactly right. It's like, no, you, you take little steps and then you get feedback and then you pivot and then you, you know, you don't like waste yeah. your time. And then, and that, that way you're kind of like, okay, this is resonating and what parts are resonating more. And then that's how you start to craft and hone that philosophy that you have and, and build basically a business. Yeah. Out of it. I mean, what's, what's interesting is that I, like you have to dial, like put into your process, these kind of gut check. What if I'm wrong moments? Like when I was writing the book, you know, I'm writing a book that's, it was the biggest swing I could imagine taking on like the deepest, deepest, most deepest ingrained assumptions I saw and introducing a new ism in the world in 2019. I mean, geez. Um, and so I made sure that my, my literary agent was someone who I could tell was skeptical of me, <laughs> but, but I just thought I want, if I can convince this person, like that's a good sign that what I'm doing is not BS. You know, I had early readers of my book be people that I knew would disagree with it. But I just thought, like, I'm not going to be right about everything. I'd love to hear what I'm wrong about while I'm still writing it <laughs> and, not, and not when it's out in the world and I can't change anything. And so, you know, really trying to integrate kind of friction and conflict and, you know, and the things that I knew in my heart, like, I feel the most uncertain about this. And that's, that's your body giving you great information which just says, hey, you need to get like more real about this thing. And we might have an initial instinct to hide from that. I hope no one else notices. You know, I hope nobody notices. And I, I'm some parts of my life, I'm like that. But with a project like this, and my name on it's gonna be there forever. I just knew that wasn't an option. And so I, I, I consciously sought in a safe way that kind of conflict that, and I'm, I'm still on that process that would just let me feel you know, I don't know, cre cre you know, push aside that imposter syndrome, give you the give you the confidence that what you're doing is real. Um, and it's easy to fake the confidence, but to have it deep down is oh, yeah. something quite different, something very different. It's it's right. It's night and day. Well, and it's when you're pat when you when you're passionate. And that's when you look at every great leader, every great, you know, success story that's ever lived, you know, they all have a, that common trait of like, and, um, I can't remember the author's name called it. It might've been uh, Napoleon Hill, but desire backed by faith is the mm. way he described it. But it's basically, it's like this part of your brain that is just so all in that you just know, like you, you're going to get there somehow. Right. And mm. without that life is just so hard. It's so much harder when you're doing something you don't really enjoy. You're waking up and you're like, Oh God, or, or you're like, you know, and of course, and, you know, there's going to be doubts and stuff, but it, you get in the beginning, but you get to a point. It sounds like you're there. I'm there with what I'm doing as well, where it's like, yes, this is it. There's going to be kicks in the kicks in the butt. There's going to, I'm going to fall on my face. I'm going to fail, but I, I'm going to, there's, you know, the, the back of your brain's like, you're going to just keep going because this is something and, and yeah. it's there and you just got to keep pushing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's so many stages of it. I mean, there's the one stage where it's just like you on your own, you on your own, plus like whoever you brought into the secret. And that's a lot of internal battle. And, you know, how to, yeah, it just ha how, to, how to check yourself on that is, is, is hard. You know, doing it multiple times gives you some experience. Um, you know, the, the threshold that I crossed recently with Bento that I, when I did, I could, I remember the similar moment in Kickstarter, um, which is just watching, seeing someone else explain it to another person. And, and, and in that, just seeing, just, just like me doing Bento now is no longer about me wanting my own idea to work out well. Me doing Bento is about it is providing value to people and I have to fulfill that. And right. so, you know, the, 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 the way of thinking about the job, what the responsibility is, all that becomes very different. It becomes less like, I hope my ego is, gets the love it wants today. And instead it's just like, well, let me log in and see what people need. Like who, 
who, who, who needs love? Who do I need to talk to? What, what do I need to be planning? And it's just, it is in service of something larger. And that makes the work just so much easier. And, and you know, that, that service notion is something I thought a lot about because, you know, the, the book and the problem I'm laying out, you know, I, I'm saying the goal of the Bento Society, we have a 30 year mission to redefine what the world sees as valuable and, and in its self-interest. And I believe that we see the world now through a lens of short-term individualism that is not truthful, that is an assumed lens that we're all seeing through, yeah. that has not always been here, that's really been like the past 30 years, it's really existed, and that in 30 years, a new lens must replace it, and one that, better, that lets us better see our obligations to each other and the future. And that this is the, this is the transformation, and it's going to take my research, all this says it takes 30 years to do it. And I have like a plan, a plan, plan. a plan, but goals. What, but when I was talking about, when I was thinking about doing this, I thought um, I have to confront the fact that I'm taking on uh, an enormous question and one that, you know, I'm probably most likely not going to succeed in doing in my lifetime. But I believe that still these ideas are correct. And like, I don't, I don't doubt the rightness and the importance of what I'm thinking about. And um, so how do I feel about that? How do I feel about the idea that maybe I start this project and maybe the day I die, it is still, you know, I, I'm still fully committed to it, but maybe it has not gone much farther. How do I feel about that? And, and while thinking about this, I went to this, I went to a museum and uh, in LA and there was this Caravaggio painting, you know, oil master, this beautiful, massive, rich paintings. And this Caravaggio painting is of this monk, this old monk, like, bent over this giant book and he's like transcribing something, you know, copying something in his book. He looks super old, just leaning over and sitting on the other side of the book across from him is a skull. And I just stood there looking at that picture for the longest time. And I just thought the skull is the last person sitting in the chair. And they added maybe the last three pages before this monk. Maybe this monk has been there writing for 50 years and he's written two pages in the book. And out of frame to the left of this painting is like a line of thousands of other monks, men and women waiting their turn to write in the book. And that this is life. This is the truth of the world. Right. And, and that if we are wanting to write a book that we're the protagonist of, it's all about us, you know, the, 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 the credits roll when we die, like, well, that gets you a world kind of like what we have right now, <laughs> possibly. But instead, if you think of your, yep. you know, you're just, you're, you're, maybe you're a, a sentence. Maybe if you're lucky, you're a paragraph. Maybe you're a, a, a pause between words in a larger sentence. And, and, that, and, and that is the truth of life. And that there is like great glory in that. And, and when I, when I like confronted that, instead of feeling terrified, I felt, um, liberated i felt relief because i thought well this idea then is bigger than me and so you know i have to i, I have to it. and um yeah but that that kind of i don't know it's just it's just, it's just actually the truth it's just actually the truth of the world and, and we're scared of it but owning it is quite powerful and, and brings all sorts of like an unexpected piece that I did not see coming at all. Right. Um, I mean, as the vacuum goes in, cue the, cue the vacuum. So, I mean, I, I love like everything you're saying, like is exactly what I preach and, and talk about, you know, we we're saying it in slightly different way. I love your angle on it and how you're, you're looking at it. But at the end of the day, it's like, so I do, do you have kids by the way? Yeah. Yeah. How many kids do you have? Just one, a four year old. One, four. Okay. I've got a four and a half year old and a 15 month old. So we're, we're in similar. So, you know, when I had that, when I had my first kid and uh, I'm guessing you may have had a similar experience, it was like a total epiphany in terms of like, okay, I kind of already knew this, but now I really know what life is about. It's, it's not about me anymore. Right. Like you were just saying, I want to be part of a bigger system, a bigger, uh, you know, something where I'm, I'm helping contribute to this world going in the right direction mm. versus going in the wrong direction. Like it's been going on. and it's not all about, excuse me for one second. I'm sorry. This is, hold on. Um, I'll hold it down. What's up? Yeah. 
What's up, Tina? Nice to see you. So sorry about that. Was not expecting that. Coming back. <laughs> uh, gotta love that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's like, right, you're just a cog, right? And if you try to, like you were just saying, like, changing, I love this 30-year view and that you've, thought, you've actually thought it through and you have a plan. And you're like, well, this is realistically versus just being like, most people wake up and like, I'm going to change the world today. And then they, they see they don't do it in two days. And they're like, okay, I'm going to go back to what I, was do <laughs> what I was doing before. It's like, no, like be, be okay with the fact that you're a cog and that whatever you can do to contribute. And even if you're just that comma in the sentence, but the sentence ends up becoming this, this amazing thing on its own. And you're, you're, you're a part of that and you contribute. I love that because it does, it takes pressure off to be like, yeah. Oh my God, I have to change the world. I have to do this. I have to do that. And it's just, it becomes like overwhelming and, and humans. And it, and it doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way. You know, right. the, the, things do change that way. That is, that is what I think of as violent change. Violent, not meaning actual, doesn't mean just actual violence, but like, you know, forced change. And, and um, there's all sorts of amazing books about generational changes and just how, you know, the, the world is a party. The world is a party. And, um, and you can imagine that when you're born, you enter into the party for the first time. You walk in, you know, someone, they like, people show you where the snacks are, where the drinks are, but you have to like stay a wallflower until like the age of 18. And then you can like start to get on the periphery of the dance floor, but really like, the center of the dance floor is people like 40, 40 to 60. They're picking the music, they're setting the house rules, they're running the show. Right. You know, but once they turn 60, they go into like a quiet room to chill out and then they don't, they're gone from the party. <laughs> and the younger ones keep moving up, but like, but there's a constant, both a handover, a transition, a cultural transition of like, you're learning how things work by how, what, what things are like when you get there but it also changes much, much quicker than we can imagine. If you think about, you know, we, we have kids the same age, like for my kid, you know, fires, viruses, you know, all these things are normal. These are very normal things. Like right. hearing, hearing children, you know, asking about the sickness and that being just like normal. It's just normal now. Like we don't, that doesn't get put back in the bottle. Like the, this is just the world that we are in at this point. Um, and yeah, and so we, yeah, I don't, I don't know where, <laughs> only dark, only dark places there, but I, but I, but I, 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 I think that that kind of horizon, a horizon that is, you know, you have a larger destination in mind, um, obviously gives you such an advantage because most people are, you know, just not even, not even just like material struggle, but just like are struggling to get through the day to day of like things they need to do, matching up with what they want with who they are, even knowing who they are, even knowing what they want. And so, you know, all those things are tremendously powerful. And then if you layer on top of them, like a longer term goal, I, I just think you, you're, you're in a world of the blind, you know, and, and, and you're just seeing at a different level. And, and, you know, the history is full of that level of vision and and we've let our vision dissipate over the last 15 years i mean now now it's like we can't imagine the future beyond like the next iphone release like that's that's how we track time like beyond that who even knows and of course now in the age of corona and COVID, of course like the future really you know is really is hard to see right. uh, but you know there, there's just an opening up that can happen and what i've seen in teaching people the bento is just allowing people to see what their future me is, to listen to them, to like learn to dialogue with that person. Um, it, begin, it gives your now meaning. You know, you, you come to see how you're always standing on this like precipice between now and the future. And every that's decision exactly right. is, is every a chance decision. to manifest. Right. You know? that's, that's, and so like we were saying earlier, like, I mean, it's so funny hearing you say this stuff because it's exactly how my brain works. And so I actually have an exercise. So I, I talk about the five core life and, you know, it's like, okay, what's important? Well, what really matters, right? And it's like, okay, yeah, career and finances, yes, you, you know, you have to have enough money to pay your bills, but you need to make sure you're doing something that you actually are passionate yeah. about and fills your soul like we were talking about and that you're growing your money exponentially and know how to do these things. But it's like, at the end of the day, I like to have, they, I have them do this funeral exercise. Where do you, what is said at your funeral? 
and in each of your five cores, like, and so I'll have them write down, what are the, mm -hmm. the top three things you want said about you? And that just puts an immediate spotlight on their life and they can't, there's nowhere to run or hide. It's like, okay, so now where do you stand currently? And what are the habits that you're doing currently and that, that are not leading to that? And what do you need to replace them with so that eventually, because habits compound over time and they become, mm -hmm. all right? So it's like, and what actions do you have to take that become habits that become, so that you are that person at the funeral. And I think it's just, and it's exactly what you're just saying. It's such a great way to do it because it's like, it just forces you to flash forward into your life and say, where do you want to be? Because so many people, the number one thing, right, is regret like, on their deathbed. Mm. You know, they say, oh, I wish mm. I'd done this. I, I should have done it this differently. But especially now in this insta generation where we can't see past our own, you know, I mean, it's like you look at the stock market. I mean, just what you were just saying, like, we don't see ahead. I mean, it, it's not only individuals, it's the entire world now, right? Like the stock market's not even factoring in the fact that like the SHIT could hit the fan. And that's just one example, uh, you know, of like how it's just, we're, we're just like, Oh, we'll worry about that later. And, you know, now that I have a little kid, you have a kid and, you know, future generations, like you said, it might not happen in our lifetime. I hope there is a future for these, for, for, for my, my grandkids and my great grandkids where there's actually a planet and we don't completely, you know, there's a lot of them might argue that we've, we've already gone too far on some of these things, but it's like, right. If you start thinking about that stuff now, and that's how you're living your life and basing your decisions off, then everything changes the way you yeah. see the world. And like you were saying, the giving back, it's about giving back. It's not about me, me, me. When you, you get things and, and, and that's in our nature. And that's like this, 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 this thing that comes from our, our ancestors, you know, from our, our, our caveman days where it's like, oh, I just want to get enough meat to feed myself and I just need to have shelter so I can, right? And that's manifested into, a, I need the, the nicest meals. I need the biggest mansion. I need the most power. And, but that's not, but once we, we studies have shown and science has proven, once you get to a certain level that you don't exponentially get happier after that. But yeah. yet people continue to chase it, right? And say, oh, that, this is what it's about. And it's only people like you and me, I think that, you have have gotten to this understanding point where it's like okay well now what I'll well this this is just this is just the dominant ethos of our time you know my book i i the book's called this could be our future and i share a, a study that ucla has done every year since the 1960s where they interview college freshmen about their life goals and um in 1970 the percentage of college freshmen who said being rich was essential or very important was 28 percent and that year in 1970, the most common, the most important life goal, according to college freshmen, was to, quote, develop a meaningful philosophy on life. 86% of college freshmen said that was essential. The last year of the study came out, 2017, the percentage of students who said being rich was essential, 84%. Percentage who say having a meaningful philosophy on life is essential, less than half. And the, the rise in the belief in wealth um, is the single biggest change in of like the 15 things they pull every year. And so there has been, you know, my, my belief is that, you know, the, the, the rational, the measured surpass the irrational, the unmeasured, um, and that we've put ourselves into a, a position now where we, where we've come to implicitly assume that the right choice in any decision is whichever outcome brings the greatest financial return. And, and, business and many area, realms of life that is a very useful and, and perhaps the correct litmus test to use it. But we have applied that idea to education, to healthcare, to our families, to our time, uh, to the way that we're, you know, made to feel like we're, we're always behind, like catching up to whatever the, the other smart person on the internet who is slight, we think is slightly better than us in every way and the way that consumes us, right? There are just so many things that we are buying into at this moment that um, are all very recent. You know, that, that was the striking thing from reading my book, like the same way that shift in perspective from the 70s today happened. There's so many things that we believe are just eternal, you know, always true, that are actually like have only been true of human beings in the last 35 years. And, and so as a result, we can look at these. These are choices. These are decisions we have made. These are things that can change because they change to become this. Um, and so, but it's just, you know, it's, it's, there's a great David Foster Wallace anecdote about a big fish and a little fish are swimming in the water. And the big fish says, a little fish, how's the water today? And the little fish says, what's water? Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to see our context. 
But, um, but what happens at a moment like COVID is it breaks down, it breaks down our reality. And, and what's effectively done is it's destroyed all maps we had of the world. We're still consulting these old maps because we don't know any better yet. That's exactly right. Have, the maps we had of the world until before 2020 are no longer relevant. And they were so outdated. Like, it, I, I, you know, as much as this is an awful thing, I, I've been saying this, to, you know, in, just in terms of the world of business, for example, right? That, that's the, it's, the, the landscape has changed. It's, it's never going back. And it, it needed to change. Yeah. Right. And this this is the, the the catalyst that ended up doing it. Like, I mean, working from home, you know, when you look at the fact that how much money is being spent by these big corporations on these huge offices and, 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 and then, the, you know, the insurance, the, the all this stuff. And then you got the people commuting in. I'm in Chicago. I live in a suburb. I got friends that it's very common, an hour and a half to two hours of commuting every single day. And yeah. they don't think yeah. twice about it. And you're just like, God, what you could be doing with that time to fill your soul in other ways, you know? So, so I, you know, I, I think we're now in a, what I think of as a post-permission society, where in the past, you know, the maps were so well-established that like people generally knew how things were supposed to go. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of checks. What's scary about this world is that no one knows. No one knows what's going on. And, and that, um, what I think that effectively means is that anyone that acts with confidence and boldness has the potential to just define what things are. Like, I believe someone's gonna come out and say, here's what a university is now. And it's gonna be something online and something familiar but different than what we have now. And that will just become a university at this point. Like, I, I think we're at a moment where those kinds of changes are possible just because of the degree of shift that we have undergone. It's gonna probably take us 10 years to fully realize this. And we, I think we likely have a decade of extreme darkness ahead of us. Um, uh, but in what yeah. sense, when you say that, what, what well, do you mean by that? Expand upon that. Um, I think that we have entered a phase of extended human decline and not even just human decline, decline of life on earth. Um, and you know, I live on the West coast, the fires are, you know, no joke, um, and, a, and a new normal and, um, and we're going we're gonna to be seeing more, more and more things, of course, like that. And um, yeah, and so, you know, there, there are already like weird things in the data that suggested that maybe we had reached a kind of a peak. Uh, like for instance, in 2015, US life expectancy began declining for the first time since before World War I. And the reason is opioids, you know, lack of economic opportunity, the, death of large swaths of the Midwest, the Rust Belt, all these areas where opportunity is gone. And these are- Well, that's are, only gonna go up now with, with like, that, you know, COVID and, and yes, global warming yes. and people dying of heat stroke and these such and things. And so here we have the richest nation in the history of the world has its life expectancy declining suddenly in 2015. And there's a book called Limits to Growth, very infamous book written in 1972 by these MIT scientists who argued that in the 21st century society would collapse. And it would collapse because of what they called overshoot, which is because of economic growth and population growth, we would use more of the world's resources than it could replenish. And eventually these, these systems just come to a head. And, um, and they run all these models. And the book was like widely read and widely mocked. Now it has a lot of credibility because all the awful things it said have come true. <laughs> Most of its predictions have come true. And, and what they say, what they say was that, um, in their, even in their, most, uh, in their most optimistic scenarios, human well-being continued to increase all the way until 2015, at which point the systems began to fall. And they showed different models. The standard run model, where we don't respond to the challenges we see, shows a plummeting of human welfare, like a plummeting, um, to where we're, we're going back you know, 60 years in terms of human welfare around most of the world. There are other models where we solve pollution with a technological cure. We solve infinite food production. We solve all these challenges. They ultimately prolong growth for another 30 years or so. But eventually you reach these same sort of, you know, these pinch points where it's like, well, how do you have enough soil to do, you know? And, and yeah, so- That's fascinating. What's the book called? Limits to Growth. Limits to Growth, there's three editions. They're, they're super, super brilliant. Uh, but if you, so if you read those people, 
There's a very, there's a sci-fi book right now. It's become a New York Times bestseller called Parable of the Sower, written in the 1990s. That's about right now, climate change apocalypse set in 2022. It is 100% on point. And what comes out of that book and what comes out of Limits to Growth are like, what are you supposed to do in response to a world like this? Like, this is going to be a terrible thing to live, to live through. And we're not talking about future people. We are not talking about you and I and folks watching this. And so what is it that you need? Um, you need visioning. You need positive visions of the future to work towards. Uh, otherwise, you, you will lack a purpose and you will succumb to despair. Uh, you need networking. You need to be connected to other people who share that feeling. Like, we change because of our peers. Like, peers are everything. Uh, third thing you do is you do truth telling. You, you look into the darkness. You don't be afraid of it. You try to educate yourself. You, you want to be real about it. Like somebody has to be real about this, better, might as well be you. You learn what you can do about it. And, and then finally, you, it's loving, it's loving each other. And, and, and what you discover is, yeah, you have to have a vision worth working towards your people. And then that gives you the purpose that lets you push through these moments, that gives you a sense of direction in these moments, that lets you see these moments as like painful inevitabilities that right. we must manage. That kind of and, desire backed by faith like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just allows you to, right. That's exactly definitely. right. And, and so I think, like, finding your way there with, like, these really existential kind of things, like, what will my son's life be like? I really can't say. The only thing I could say for sure is it's going to be very different than my life, you know? And I feel very fortunate to have a life I've had, you know? But I, and so, you know, and so, you know, I can just, like, hide myself in Netflix binge watching and try to pretend it's not happening. You know, I can self-medicate, uh, you know, you could do all these things or you can say, well, shit, like it's me. It's not someone else. It's like, it's me and it's my family and whatever. This is what we, this is, this is what it means to step up in this moment is to try to, is to, to look into this and not flinch and, um, and to be real about it, to be real about it. So what do you, I mean, I, I'm a thousand percent with you and, you know, without getting political, um, you know, obviously there's, there's, there's a certain mindset of, you know, and it's not just the U S it's, it's around the world. Um, you know, and it's, it's to me, you know, it's, it's approximately 50% in most places that are basically going like this versus, Hey, let's figure this out together. Right. It's no, it's, it, mm -hmm. and there's the, it's not happening denial. Like you were just saying, just, watch your Netflix, focus only on you and your family. And then there's yeah. the, Hey, wait, we, the, guys, like we got to do something here because yeah, we may be okay for the next 20 to 30 years, maybe our lifetime. But if you have kids and, and if you want this to keep going, like now is the time you can't just ignore it. And yeah. these people over here are like, Oh, you're an alarmist. You're, you're being ridiculous. And these people are like, no, yeah. I promise just please. And it's, you know, and, it's just so sad because right for, for, for us, especially who's, who's got kids and anybody that has kids, um, especially can see, like, you just want them to have what you had. And like you just said, that yeah. hit me hard when it's like my, his life is not going to be like my life. And I totally agree with that. And it's like, I think about all the things I did as a kid and the fresh air and taking, you know, the, 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 the all the things that you take for granted that he may not have. And then, you know, who knows where his kids are going to be. And like, how do you not, even if that's a small chance that that might happen, how do you not get involved and say, okay, well, yeah. let's just play it safe and, and sure. But you still, there's still so many people that just say, nah. And like you're saying, that totally makes sense. That statistic of money, 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 just focus that me and money and my family and, and what I'm doing. And I don't care about anything else at all. Don't be an alarmist. It'll all, like you said, you know, uh, these people think it's all going to work. I have, I, have a, I have a friend in Cape town in South Africa who's telling me about how, a couple of years ago, there was a major drought in South Africa and in the richer neighborhoods, people, and they're like ga mass, massive gated walled communities. Um, and the richer neighborhoods, people bought their own water tanks and there would be these water trucks driving into the rich neighborhoods every day, delivering water while the poor areas didn't have any. And at a certain point, things got so bad and uh, a large crowd of um, poor people ended up breaching these walls and going in and taking the water, destroying a lot of the water. And it was like this, this, this huge, ugly moment. But, you know, my, my friend's lesson was 
if those folks had used their money to provide water for everybody along with themselves, like it probably would have been fine. Uh, but instead it was like only provide for myself. As long as I'm good, things will work out. But there, there's a breaking point to that. There's a breaking point to that. And, exactly and, it's, right. and it's, it's hard to see, you know, people's, I, I've come to feel that people don't really change their minds very often, but that the world changes and that we right. must respond to how the world has changed. And, you know, the ingredients in the U.S. for our, you know, total social dysfunction, those ingredients have been in the oven for a while. They've right. been cooking for a while. They're baked in. It's not something you could just stop. It's not just the Internet. You know, it's happening in talk radio. It's happening in partisanship, happening all, all the, you know, long, long running thing that's gotten us here. And you ultimately need a crisis to change this. You need a crisis that redefines reality that gives people permission to move off of old positions and define new positions. Now, what's amazing is that COVID-19 is the perfect crisis for doing that. The perfect crisis, it affects everybody. It's like, it's all around the world. We need all of science to come together. It requires social, social cooperation. It's right. like, the, and, and we're facing a, a united enemy of like another species. Right. You know, it's like, right. Like it's an alien like, invasion. This is the alien invasion. This is like everything you want for us to come together. And it's like, you know, it's, it's almost like nature just played us this hand to be like, here right. we go. Here's your here shot, go. guys. Get your it kids, together. Your kids won't get sick. It's just the old people, blah, 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 blah. Here, you got it. And, right. and, you know, and of course, most places around the world, you know, that has been the case. That has been the case. But then you see in the U.S. and you especially see with, you know, just this – especially this extreme right, you know, conspiracist edge that's now showing up in a lot of countries that, you know, it's just, it's just returning the same battles to this moment. And so what this means then, what this is going to mean is that we're going to need a bigger crisis. Uh, that this it ends up that 200,000 people dead in five months and in most of, you know, what we think of as normal human activity stopping. But that is not enough. That is not enough to get us to God, change. You are, yeah, I, I change where we are. But you, you, you're so right. I mean, it's, I, I, I mean, that's a really interesting way that you're putting that, and and it's, it's like right. It's like here it is. Like here's your opportunity, and we're we're not we're not getting it together. I mean, and, like and, that's and, place. and I would say that, and I would say, and I would say there has to be movement on the right and the left. You know, it's it's everyone everyone makes themselves feel good by thinking Absolutely. everyone else needs to change. But, you know, I'm, I'm a more progressive minded person, but I grew up in, you know, the South and I like, I, 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 have, I have no hate anywhere, you know? And even my, even my friends on the left, you know, like the solutions that people are looking for are ultimately some kind of totalitarian solution, you know, because it seems like what, what common ground do we have? And so we are putting ourselves in a position now, again, mainly in the US, other countries don't have this. This is like right. a, a very, very American problem at this point. But you have two totalitarian perspectives that are incompatible with one another. Mm -hmm. And and we are meant to create a union out of those things is the, is the notion of our government. So, yeah, I, I look at coronavirus as like it was a layup. It was a layup. You know, the, the post-war era for America was a layup. Like this has been, I think, like the biggest choke, one of the biggest choke jobs in history, both the manage of COVID and America of the last 25 years, just like giving it away, giving away what, you know, centuries of work, um, so much and just and giving it away in like the all the most easy, predictable reasons, you know, as predictable as like a, a guy getting a sports car and a new wife in middle age, you know, it's just like, it's just like the most basic a Corvette, stuff that we're getting wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I mean, that, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, we're right. We're at the, we're at this kind of crossroads and you're sort of like, okay, well, what, which way are we going to go? And, and what you just said, I, I don't want it to get brushed over. It's so important is the way our system is set up with mainly Republicans and Democrats. Yes, there's independent, but the, the way it's gone for the, since the beginning of time, that's never really been an option. Right. It's like, and then you have two completely warring parties with different ideals that think the other person is the enemy and we expect when when that changes over every four to eight years to be able to make progress like how's 
how can you make progress when the one person that, that gets in there and party is going to completely do everything they can to undo what the other people did, right? And you, you mentioned 25 years. Yes. Like you look at what's happened and it's like, you get a Republican and you get a Democrat and then it's like, we're undoing. And now especially is just a real scary time. And, and it goes back to what you said earlier, like that whole study with money and how that, you know, power money becoming the focus and people, you know, our leaders basically making people think that's okay. Yeah. Not only is that acceptable, but it's, it's, it's like, yeah, it's so like was, Gordon you know, Gecko. After, greed is good. Yeah. I mean, after 9-11, Bush's call was go shopping. You know, what can you do for your country? You can go shopping, you know, right. the, the, that's been our, that's been our answer. And yeah, and it's, it's, it's worked for a while in some ways, worked super well for some people. Um, but I believe that the that old era is gone, and that um, and that we're yeah we're just in a new moment in history. And you know I think there's a lot of things to be optimistic about. I think there are a lot of things to be very pessimistic about. Um, and you know like the future of business I think has very little to do with people. <laughs> the future of business is um, financial engineering and robots. And, um, and maybe there's customers at the end point, possibly. Uh, but I really, I think the future of business has like actually very little to do with directly with society, like how it's being thought of, you know, uh, and what, what we're likely to see with like the consolidation that's happening now. So another um, one of those maps you were talking about earlier, that's completely. Yeah, it's just totally, it's totally different. So to me, the step to take is the kinds of things that limits to growth and parable of the sower, like being unafraid, creating a vision of what it is that you want to work towards while being real about, hey, if my life goal is to go to every country before I die, probably not going to happen. If my life goal is I'm surrounded by people I deeply care about and we all can support one another and we have a, a interdependent flourishing with one another, awesome. That's like a great goal to have these days. Um, and so our goals are going to have to change. But if you just start to think about yourself in terms of there's a now me that's maybe going through hard times right now, but there's a future me that sees the bigger picture. I always think of my future me as like this version of me 10 years from now, more salt and pepper. I imagine in their hair. I imagine them standing on a cliff of time, like looking back. And, and, and I always think of my future me looks at me with this compassion, the same way that I look at, I today look at my adolescent self as like a good person who is trying to do their best during a really hard time. And so my future me looks at me that way. Just like, hey, you're, this is hard. This is hard for everybody. You're doing your best. You're doing your best. But you just get that perspective. And then you integrate your us. Who are my people? If you're only thinking about you, yeah, it's like life feels small. But if you're thinking about others in terms of like what is core to you, life is rich. Life, life is so deep. And, and same with thinking of this future us, imagining, not waiting for things to one day get better, but actually thinking, you know what, what I do this week, let's imagine that it matters. Let's imagine that what I do just this week matters. And so, you know, this is like a big way of thinking about the world, but I ground this in like making a weekly to-do list using these four boxes. You know, what am I doing for my now me this week? What is my future me telling me this week that I should keep in mind? What my future us, if I want the world to be better, what, what can I do this week? And you know what? You, you find things. You find things. And, and for me, my weekly to-do list has evolved from just like errands and work stuff to errands and work stuff plus, hey, here's five friends I'm going to call this week. Here's the thing I'm going to read. Here's something I'm going to learn about. You know, here's how I'm going to try to be a better parent this week. And, and I'm like a year into my life operating that way using that structure. And it's phenomenal. And, and I do a weekly Zoom call with folks of the Bento community um, called the Weekly Bento, where we do this together. We do exercises like every Sunday morning. You know, about sixty of us get together and do this. And um, it's, you go to bitly uh, bit.ly/weeklybento. Um, yeah, I'm but check it out you know, right to me, now. to me, it's just about it's about practicing. You know, you just practice, practice living in those other spaces of yourself, getting comfortable there starting to know what your opinions are, what you think. And because a lot of it just starts there. What do you even want? Like, that's a hard, that's actually a hard question. And then once you start to have those things, then, then, you know, 
instead of at a down moment, you get pulled into like checking your email for the 50th time in the hour, or you get pulled into comparing yourself to someone that you don't think you're as good as. Instead, you look at your bento, you look at the things you've wrote, written down that are important to you, and you, you're reflecting on what your deepest priorities are. And you're like, you know what, instead of wasting my time on Twitter for the next six minutes, I'm just going to call this friend. I was going to say what's up. And that's it. Right. That's all I'm going to do. And you know what? It's like you, are, you feel full. You feel full of so many things after that. When you look at Twitter for six minutes, you feel empty. You feel empty afterwards. There's, no, there's nothing there for you. There's nothing yep. there for you. And so, but these are, these are strong, strong patterns, loops we find ourselves in. So we have to create habits. We have to create intentionality. We have to create ritual. Like, because, you know, we're all weak. We're all weak. I'm so weak. I'm so weak. I need so many things to help myself be the person I'm projecting to you right now. You know, I have, I have so many tools and scaffolding up around me because I'm a human being. And that's just that's what it's exactly like. It. And, and right, your, your, your vulnerability and your willingness to admit that is, is exactly the type of uh, mindset, the people, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, bentoism, the people need to start taking on if we're going to change. You know, like I said, I'm saying the same thing. You are slightly different with these yeah. cores. It's like, okay, like, you know, you're talking about pick up a phone and call your friend. That's your relationship core. And, and within each, you have, you know, you're talking about these actions you're taking and to me, I, I, I just I, I just associate them with habits because to me, you know, mm -hmm. your your brain scientifically, it's just the way it works. Like we develop these habits. So your brain doesn't care if they're good or bad, helping or right. 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 They're they're doing their thing and they're gonna pay dividends over time, one way or the other. And so the idea is, okay, like like we were both saying, flash forward to that future. What does that person want? Where, where does that person want to end up? And then what are the habits that are that you, right now are not bringing you there? And then are, mm -hmm. are not taking you to that place. And what do you have to replace them with? And then it starts with those, you know, small actions each day. And you don't want to overwhelm yourself. And all of a sudden, like I, I too, I, it's so funny. Like I, I, very similar to you, I have an Excel sheet and it's an app that I'm building. that ties into all this, but I, I literally have my five cores and I have the habits I'm working on that week and my goals. And I go through it every single, I rate myself every single day overall. How mm. did I do today? Mm. Um, in my five cores on a scale of one to five. And then at the, at the end of the week, once a week on Monday, I actually go through in detail and I say, okay. And I yeah. look at each habit and it just forces me to become aware. And, you know, then throughout the day, I'm, I'm doing that habit where I'm looking at my, I'm checking my email for the fifth time in, in an hour. And I'm like, what are you doing? This is not aligned with your cores and your habits and where you want to end up. This is a time waster. This is, this is not productive. You know, what are the things that are most important to you and what are those actions you're trying to take today and are you taking them? And so I just, I love that the, you have that philosophy and you're saying it in your way, which ties into it. And it, it proves to me, it's really good to hear you say it because I have a lot of respect and admiration for you and what you've been able to do and, and where you are in your journey to, to kind of say, okay, yeah, I'm on the right track too. Just like you said, we're all yeah. humans, we're all vulnerable and sometimes yeah. you doubt yourself. I mean, we're, 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 you know, our boats look different, but we're all in a similar boat. You know, and if I look at like who's who's in Bento, who's a member of the Bento Society, like there are CEOs there, there are VCs who are members who come to our meetings. There's also like people who don't have a home. Uh, there's also people that work at Walmart. You know, and I love that it's all and we're and like we're in breakouts with each other, helping each other out, talking about what we're going through, like all struggling to because we're all humans, right? It doesn't matter what paycheck you have. Just like you said, money is not the focus. I love that. Yeah. I love that. So somebody had asked real quick where, where to find that. I want to make sure that. So yeah, they... so um, it's called the Weekly Bento. If you go to bit.ly bit slash weekly bento, you can just leave your email address. Um, I send out the schedule each week. Uh, so that happens on Sundays. And then if you like it, we also do uh, group bentos, which are pods of eight people that are self-managed. And they go through a 12-week experience. And each week, I you get a prompt for what you're going to go through together. But that's about creating a just a tight group of people that you go through this transformation together and um you know, all this stuff is free this is just like i don't know just just fo just following following my own future me what it what, so it what is your and i love that and right i mean you're you're putting your money where your mouth is it's, uh, there's irony there 
<laughs> yeah. Um, because it's the opposite. You, you know, you're basically saying, look, this is my philosophy and, and you're proving it by, and I'm, I'm right with you. For the last two years, I haven't made a single dime. I have no, you know, eventually I, I have an app and stuff and I'm like, okay, well, great. If I can cover some of my costs with that and my book and, and, and this movement and, and, and be able to, but I, you know, I know I'm comfortable enough and I can live. And so it's just like, I just want to, I'm the exact thing as you. I just want to give it and, and figure out the best way to get as many people involved and into it and and you know not try to profit and that's that's the difference between you and me and like most of the people out there and it's hard for people to tell because there's all these people you know now with social media it's like what do you listen to who do you who do you know like this guy's telling me he can he can sell me the elixir to happiness for 9.99 do i listen to him you know Mm -hmm. and it's just like and it's Mm -hmm. tough and again if you haven't been raised with the right values and 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 certain habits and and uh, this philosophy, like you and I are both talking about, of like, where do I want to be my future self? And you're just kind of going from to do to do and, and, and uh, screen to screen. Like it's, it's a really sad, sad way to live. And it's becoming more and more prevalent and technology is great, but here we are now in this stage where it's like, how do we use that technology to actually help us level up? And that's what my whole thing is about. I think for, I think for both of us, you know, I mean, I certainly live my life that way for a, a fair amount of it. Um, and most of us, you know, the, the, you, you have the lucky or unlucky moment uh, 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 of having a crucible moment where you're forced into some challenging situation that just like rewrites how you see the world. And, and it's generally after those sorts of moments that we become more conscious of what we think about and what we care about. And really, that only happens through pain and struggle. Like it's hard to get there without that. And um, and so, mm-hmm. you know, the, I agree the, with that. That that gives you that gives you that opportunity. And you know, I, I find people will often assume that this idea of like seeing your full self interest that this is like a a privileged position. This is something you can only do with wealth. Uh, but I think it's the exact opposite. Um, if someone is wealthy, like they can indulge their now me until the cows come home. Um, they can be all about their selfish individuals. And yes, they might have more for retirement. You know, they might have like their future locked away, but I think they are, are trapped in the materialism of now me. If you think of someone uh, who doesn't have money and whose now me is hard, you know, they're struggling to make ends meet. What does that person do? Well, that person, they tend to lean on a community of others more, right? right? They have their us of people that are there to support them. That's a place of strength. They also, people of, of lower means, will tend to have higher religious beliefs. So they're actually, you're leaning towards this future me ideal of the meaning of my actions will be born out when I die, that there will be an afterlife or not. So actually, I think for someone who is in a place of insecurity, there's actually a high awareness uh, of these dimensions and, and people like reach to those things as places of strength. Um, and, that, and that these are things that, that we all need and, and all get fed by. But to me, I, I really look at the lessons of every major religion. Like the Bible says, it's, it's easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye than a rich man to get into heaven. And every, every major religion says that like there is a, there is a problem of selfish materialism and that is a limitation and that it will block you from reaching nirvana. Isn't that ironic nirvana. that, so, so to me, what that says is we innately as humans know that that's something, right? Like that's, that's one of these universal truths that it's like, okay, this one's yes. real because every single religion, whether it's the smallest tribe in Africa to, you know, Christianity has the same sort of belief system on that yet we do the exact, we, we spend 99% of our time doing the exact opposite. And, and, and that is especially true of the last 30 years uh, of the world that we have lived in. It, it has never been more true than this moment. And, um, and this, is what, this is what the world falling apart is gonna, is gonna force us to confront. So you know, maybe, maybe my, my, my closing thoughts for folks would just be to be ready for the ride to get worse. Um, be prepared for there no going back and find the strength in, and really seeing all the spaces where you leave a footprint and think about what those people have said, you know, networking, visioning, truth telling, loving, learning, like these are things that empower you, that prepare you 
that are investments in yourself and in others and in like the world actually becoming better. Um, and so that's at, at a moment where everything is crumpling, it might not feel like much, but you know, to, to paraphrase, I think it's a Margaret Mead quote, like it's the only way things have ever changed is it, it, starting with things like that. It's the only way. So, you know, that, that's what it takes. And, um, and so for, you know, this is, it's a little bit about protecting what's here now. I think a lot of it's about being ready for what are the institutions, the systems that we need for the world that we're in now that we still are only beginning to recognize. Because again, the old, the old map doesn't work anymore. Um, and so it's time to start making the new one. And that's, and that's exactly right. And like you said earlier, you know, we're, I, and I agree with you. It's like, look at it in terms of we've, we've maybe peaked and we're heading down this way. And unless we start changing as an entire, you know, world together and, and start doing these things you're, you and I are both talking about, it's just going to keep going like this. And the only way to kind of flatten it out and start heading back up is to, you know, focus on these, what's really important and what really matters and not the money part. So I got one last question for you. Yeah. Speaking of the money. So, you know, I'm curious to hear your take because part of me, the haves and the have nots are becoming, would you agree that that is becoming more and more extreme and that the have nots are, are growing and the, and the haves are shrinking in terms of the percentage. However, the, the disparity in wealth is actually higher, right? So the, 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 the people that these, the top, whatever 1% you want to call it, that have all the wealth, yeah. Um, and you know, it, it, they're getting more and more of that wealth. And then these yeah. people over here are getting less. Of How do you see that playing out? Like we talk about dark times and not, you know, not to get all morbid and stuff, but do you think that there's going to be a reckoning there where it's going to, you know, I mean, you're already starting to see looting and, and you, you can, you can feel the anger with these people of just like, you know, wanting to feel like treated equally and feel like a human being and, and just getting continually pushed, pushed down and down. What do you see happening and how that play, plays out in the next 10 to 15 years or so? I think, uh, I don't know that I see it playing out that differently than it does today. I mean, I feel like in a world where, you know, there's a study that the Rand Corporation did that came out last week that um, I write about in my book how from 1973 to today, the average American worker's pay has risen by 10%. So, um, and if you factor in inflation, that means the high point for American worker pay was 1973, the same year Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon came out. And ever since then, workers have been losing. If you change that trajectory and have workers continue to get paid the way they were being paid from the 1940s to 1973, today the average American salary would be $110,000 a year. Um, every single, in, the lowest paid salaries would be making $66,000 a year. Every single income group would see at least a 50% increase in their pay. The only group that loses out is the 0.01%. That is the only group whose pay changes if we try to reflect a different system. So that shows you uh, where things are going. Um, but I think, but I So think do you not see a reckoning coming with that? Like 0.01%? In the, in, the in, the in the U.S., no. In, in the U.S., money is power. Um, the U.S. is an oligarchy. It's not a democracy. But numbers are power, yeah. too, right? So at yeah, one yeah, point, but, when you've got 99.9% of the population... But, 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 if you, but if you had a united... If you had, like, a united classes, sure. If all the poor people of the world were united together, sure. But, you know, in the U.S., half of them are Democrat, half of them are Republican. So there's no agreeing on what the problem is, which is intentional, by the way. Interesting. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's arguments that even like World War I was fought because there were too many men with like inconvenient political opinions. So they need to create a world war to get rid of them and give them things to do, <laughs> you know? Like there, there's, there's like funny ways to think about that, you know, power has thought about human lives. And, and so I, I think that, um, yeah, I think the goal in the U.S. is to uh, destroy government and to turn the U.S. into a capitalist autobahn where power is purely about where, – where what's right is about power and it's about economic power and physical power. And I think that, like, that's the direction of, like, warlords and, you know, uh, corruption. And I think that's the way the U.S. is going right now, you know. Um, so your solution would be – I mean, my – I don't think there is a solution to this moment. I think, I, think, I think it's been in the oven for too long. I don't know how you undo this. I don't know how you do. Um, 
You would like to think a great leader could, you'd like to think a moment could, um, but it has, those things haven't worked to date. Those things haven't worked to date. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, what are the events that get people to change their position? And the fact that COVID hasn't done, the fact that COVID has maybe only ratcheted up right, is, yeah, for sure. is, is quite discouraging. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a person dying every minute, uh, you know, from this thing. And, and that, you know, still we, we are living in a, in a shared disrea unreality. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, 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 I hope for a miracle. Um, I don't know what it looks like. It's harder for me to picture that than it is to picture the, where the trajectory we're on might, might keep going. Um, yeah. I don't know. I wish I had a better answer. Hey, it was an honest answer, you know, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. Um, it's something I think about a lot, you know, and, and, and you know, with my kids and like, you know, when, earlier you made that comment about our kids aren't going to see, are going to have the same experiences. And that's a hundred percent. I agree. Um, they're gonna, the world's going to be different for them and how they experience it. And I just read, I play these scenarios out in my mind. I try not to go down the rabbit hole, but critical thinkers like yourself, I like to get opinions on from um because you know i you know there's part of me that thinks right like you were saying it's like it's either going to take a, a great leader that comes in and says look f all that like to me as long as we have two parties we're never going nothing's ever going to change so somehow the party system has to go away it, and it has to just become about and even just having one person leaving the country um but again it's not like that's going to happen like that but you know you got to you got to put it out there in the universe and you got to start talking about these things otherwise they'll never happen but as long as like we were saying earlier you know you have this one's on this side and this one's on this side and then we just keep going back and forth and undoing each other's progress we're caught in this you know, failure I, I, loop i th i think it's about you know where do we want to be part of me was imagining 2050 you know what is what does the world look like that's better than it is now that's credible and then what are the, what's the break, what's the, what's the major breakthrough that let us get there? And for me, for me answering that question, what does that better world look like? It looks like one where we actually feel a strong sense of responsibility for one another and for our, for right. our own lives. And that, what is it that could prompt that to happen? To me, it was about, well, we learned to see where, where we are differently. We learned to like see our form in a new way that I think is closer to the reality and maybe with that kind of deeper change, because, you know, asking people to change their values will never work. People's values are deep and they're real and they're earned through experience. Right. Um, but you can create, you can change the context. You can, you know, other things that can change. You can change um, their perception. Right? Yeah, yeah. Change the Because, like, you know, values are, yeah, are they're right. still, it's still perception. It's like, these are my values, but I, it's how I perceive life. And that's why yeah, I believe yeah. what I believe. Yeah. If you we change, go like you're saying, if you shift. Yeah, I don't want to change. I don't want to change anybody, right? I, I just want to make people aware of what's really at play for them. And my and my optimistic assumption is that, you know, I'm, I'm buying into Adam Smith's idea of like you can trust people to act according to their self-interest. The issue is, is we've just settled on the too narrow definition of self-interest. But if we empower people with a more truthful notion of what their self-interest actually is, I think people will generally do the right things. Like I, I could see that I'm an optimist at, at heart, despite all the things I'm saying here, I am an optimist. Um, and, but you know, putting, how could we be in a position where we have the opportunity to like make those better choices for ourselves? But, but anyway, but yeah, I mean, you know, the bento is a, is a practical way to do it. And, and so tell us now again, uh, where we yeah. can find, uh, Go to bentoism. yeah, bentoism.org. Um, you can learn more about Bento. You can leave your email address there. Or if you want to sign up for the weekly, that's just bit.ly slash weekly Bento. Fantastic. And we're going to cut these up. There's so many nuggets in here. So I have a team. Yeah. And what we do is we cut up the little, the gems, and then we're going to repost them. So there'll be a lot more people seeing this. And then, um, because you, you had some really, really great insights, Yancey. Thank you so much for being yeah, on the so show. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, really for, thanks folks for hanging out. Been awesome. Yeah, and I and, uh, definitely want to keep connected with you. Like we were saying earlier, yeah. it's all about like-minded people and, and with the same passion and purpose, and it sounds like we're there. And so hopefully everybody awesome. listening is, is on the same boat, and they go to check out your website and your stuff. And I certainly will, and I may start joining those Bento groups. On, all right, awesome. On awesome. All right, man. Thanks so Peace. much. Peace. Later, y'all. Take care.
That's it for the Five Core Life podcast with Will Moore. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. If you have not already, please make sure to follow and subscribe to the podcast so that you get notified when an episode drops every week. If you haven't joined the Five Core Life Facebook group yet, I encourage you to also join that and see what all the fuss is about. There's some really great, awesome content there designed to get your momentum going, including a monthly giveaway where you can win a complimentary coaching call with the Will Moore himself. The Facebook group is currently the only place to get Will's dedicated attention and support on your five core journey. If you're feeling stuck or just want someone to cheer you on, that's the place that you need to be. There's nothing like a community of people on the same journey to get you fired up, kicking butt, and taking names. So come join us. Well, get moving, gain momentum, Join the movement. Join Emmett by going to moremomentum.com to take a free life evaluator quiz on where you currently stand in each of your five courses.